right, how are you doing? Of course, the world is now gripped by a global public health emergency. Now, healthcare systems in even the most advanced countries are being overwhelmed. As of yesterday, 28th of March 2020, the global figures stood at 571,678 of persons who have tested positive for coronavirus, while 26,494 have succumbed since the disease outbreak. Now, as the pandemic spreads, the coronavirus will disproportionately impact the world's most vulnerable, among them refugees, asylum seekers, and internally displaced persons, otherwise known as IDPs. Now, overall, logistics uh, sector will also be directly hindered by the pandemic and will suffer the sharpest blow. Around 90% of vessels have actually delayed their arrival time by as much as 40 days, with lockdowns, whether uh, full or partial, being touted as one of the best ways in enforcing social distancing. Those that live from hand to mouth remain most susceptible uh, to such decisions. Now, tonight on this special edition of Youth Connect, we'll be focusing on what needs to be done to reduce the impact of COVID-19 on the region, particularly on the vulnerable in our communities. My name, as always, is Eugene and Nangwe and Josephine Oko is our sign language interpreter. Remember, this program is interactive. All you need to do is talk to us. All you need to also add while you're tweeting is the hashtag YouthConnect. In the course of the program, we'll be sampling some of your tweets that you've been sending throughout the day. Allow me now to introduce our ABLE panel that is joining us uh, remotely on this particular program. We have Andrew Mould, who's joining us all the way from Kigali, Rwanda, and he is uh, with the UN Economic Commission for Africa. Thank you so much for joining us, Andrew. Also with us on the panel is Kagure Wamoyo, Chief Strategy Officer at Kobo uh, 360. And of course, later on in the program, we'll be joined by none other than Octo Pizzo himself, who's an artist and philanthropist. Also with us on the panel is um, Innocent Zeimana, who was actually evacuated from Italy and he is now safe at home in Kigali, Rwanda. Later on, we'll also be joined by Alexandra Lamash, who's senior advocate for West and Central Africa with the Refugees International. Let me start with you, Andrew. Uh, where you sit in Kigali uh, with the UN Economic Commission for Africa, uh, this particular pandemic is actually something that is now affecting the world but of course africa is expected to uh, be impacted in a very major way yet many africans believe that this is not their fault especially when you look at the origin of this particular virus how do we ensure that those who will be adversely impacted yet it is not their fault are cushioned from the impact of the covid 19 andrew Yes, well, thank you, uh, Eugene. I mean, obviously, it's a worrying time, I think, across the world, isn't it, in terms of how uh, we're going to be able to mitigate the impacts of this crisis. It's pretty unprecedented. Um, at the Economic Commission for Africa, our tentative uh, estimate so far is it's going to reduce economic growth very substantially this year. Uh, and you see that in the region as well. So, for example, Kenya revised its growth forecasts also downwards very substantially. Um, I think it's important to point out that the economic impact may be rather different than in other regions and that, that's for a couple of reasons. Firstly, the structure of African economies are rather different. Um, there's a lot more dependence still on agriculture and the ag rural sector. Um, this is a disease which is particularly impacting on urban areas across the world, so that's one particular challenge. Um, but for Africa, with a lot of people still dependent on uh, you know, subsistence farming, I think the impact on those rural areas may be more moderate. I think the real concern is about how to deal with uh, the problem uh, for the urban populations across uh, the Eastern Africa region. Um, a second characteristic I think it's important to point out of the disease is the way that it impacts on, on older populations much more than younger people. And of course the demographics of Eastern Africa, they're going our favor in the sense that a lot of countries, you know, you have maybe as much as 50% of the population which is under 20 20 years old. So I think the health impacts, they're going to be serious, um, but they may have a differential impact on our particular region, uh, precisely because of the young nature of the population. Um, yeah, so those would be my opening observations. 
cannot be able to see each other face to face, but virtually, I'd like you to look directly into the camera. I might be able to have a feeling that we are looking uh, into each other's eyes. So kindly just look into the camera. Uh, perfect. That is amazing. Let me now bring in uh, Kagure Wamoyo. Uh, you work with Kobo 360. Of course, there is um, a lot of talk on the impact of this particular virus uh, on the transport sector. We understand countries have actually affected uh, some sort of lockdown, some partial others in full swing talk to us a bit about uh, the current state of affairs when it comes to the transport sector because we understand that around 90 percent of the vessels have actually delayed their arrival time by as much as 40 days what sort of impact will this have in the economies so at the moment um, the transport sector is actually focused in ensuring that we keep supply chains going mm -hmm. especially for essential goods mm -hmm. now we are part of what we consider the essential services because food needs to get to people it needs to get to the supermarket raw materials that make fmcg actually need to get to manufactured so what we're saying is that um, in the continent about a uh, delay of about 40 days in 90 percent of the vessels in the markets that we serve we're in kenya as kobo uh, we're in we're in uganda we're in togo we are in Ghana and Nigeria, and so we're seeing mixed um, impact. But one thing for sure is that there's been delays in the supply chain, um, also delays in border crossing. So food moving, for example, from Kenya to Uganda, because of the health checks that need to be done across the border, there are delays right there. Food is not being able to um, get from the agricultural farms to the cities. Some of the markets we are in are facing actually some form of lockdown. So we are anticipating that it's going to get a bit tough in the supply uh, in the supply chain and logistics sector. But everyone is committed, and that's called we're committed because we know people to survive. We will need medicine for people to survive. Right. Uh, Andrew, I see you nodding your head right there. I need you to just stay with us um, um, because I'll just definitely come back to you uh, um, when I need a question uh, on the UN uh, Economic Commission for Africa. Uh, in the meantime, let me just uh, bring in Innocent Zeymana, who's an evacuee from Italy. Um, Innocent, you are at the heart of what today many people are concerned as far as uh, the death toll, you know, in thousands uh, in just 24 hours. Here you are, seated uh, home safe and sound take us through the uh, whole scenario i mean what was it like uh, before we now get you to uh, maybe dial into uh, the sort of impact of this particular uh, pandemic In i i can't be able to hear you Let's see if we can be able to... Oh, sorry. All right, good. Now, let's... Okay, now you hear me? Yes, yes. Now we can hear you. Okay. Thank you, Eugene, for the invitation, yeah, for this conversation. Uh, I was saying, actually, I'm, now I'm not home. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm in, uh, a, in one of the isolation uh, place uh, uh, that the government has set. Mm -hmm. uh, now I'm of course comfortable in that place uh, and i can only go home after uh, 14 days of quarantine mm -hmm. uh, so um, as you said i've been to italy one of the most affected countries with this um, uh, covid 19 and uh, uh, along the long way of uh, my evacuation up to here, mm -hmm. I've seen a uh, much, much impact of this uh, pandemic. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, the, 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 long, the, the way has been really, really difficult mm -hmm. because you, you, you understand that uh, moving that far away uh, with the uh, airports closed, with the uh, borders closed it was really not easy uh, but with the help of the uh, government through uh, embassies uh, I've been able to make it uh, so it, it started uh, when the the suspension of all arriving uh, flights 
uh, were announced. Uh, and uh, I was still having one week in Italy, but I said, uh, what will happen uh, after the closure? I, I will not be able to uh, to move back in my country where I have to go uh, back and uh, play my role uh, as a doctor there. Mm -hmm. uh, so I contacted the uh, my ministry mm -hmm. and uh, immediately the embassy uh, came in and uh, started to help me moving. Mm -hmm. So it ended up that uh, the uh, the government has put uh, uh, flights and organized a, f a free flight mm -hmm. from uh, Amsterdam mm -hmm. to Kigali. Uh, and they had only three days to catch the last one, which was on 25th. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I had to be helped by many people. Mm -hmm. And it started by me moving with uh, an ambulance mm. from uh, from my home to the train station. Mm. Uh, it was the only way from the the city where I was, in that, which was Pisa, uh, to Rome, where I could find a flight to Belgium, Brussels. Mm. So uh, I got to the train station and uh, I moved all, almost alone in the train mm. to home. Uh, to Rome. Uh, arriving at Rome, I had a flight in the next morning, but uh, when it comes to time of check-in, uh, they couldn't me allow. Uh, they couldn't allow me to check in because they said uh, Brussels at Brussels will not be able to uh, to go out because the borders are closed. Mm. Uh, but uh, with the help of uh, uh, emb uh, our embassy in um, France and Belgium. Uh, it, uh, I ended up flying to Brussels in the evening, uh, and from there I took uh, uh, many trains to arrive at uh, uh, Amsterdam because there was no flight from Brussels to Amsterdam. Yeah. Actually, I had to go to Antwerp, then Rotterdam, then. Uh, Amsterdam. So yeah. it was a long way, but finally I made it to uh, to Amsterdam and then from Amsterdam uh, to Kigali. So in the two flights that I took uh, from Rome to Brussels, we were only five uh, five uh, persons in the uh, the airline. Right. And from uh, and from Amsterdam to Kigali, around uh, 16 people. You can imagine that big, big um, airline, only those people. So I've seen a uh, big uh, impact all over the, along the way, but uh, uh, I'm grateful that I finally made it to Kigali. Right. And now I'm in, uh, uh, I'm safe in the Kalantine. Uh, where I have to wait the uh, 14 days. Right, perfect, innocent. Uh, we are happy for you. Must have, must have been a very difficult moment for you right there. Now, let me bring in Andrew. Andrew, um, if you can hear me now, I think one of the things that is very important to understand is that your organization, Andrew, is actually built on the framework of building capabilities, advocating for continental ideas at a global level, designing innovative financing models, among other issues. Now, considering that this is an issue that will require a lot of stimulus packages to actually you know, reboot economies across the African continent. What, what is your organization preparing for the continent along these lines, if you may, today? Well, our executive secretary actually uh, called a meeting amongst uh, finance ministers across the continent um, just last week, actually, to discuss uh, uh, ways of having a coordinated response. I think there's a general understanding that uh, some fiscal um, measures are needed uh, to support the economies. Um, the hit is going to be really quite hard, I think, the economic hit from the, from the crisis. Um, so, for example, take 
tourism for our region. It's approximately 8 to 10 percent of GDP for economies like Tanzania and Kenya and as much as uh, 14 percent of GDP here in Rwanda. And uh, that business is basically dried up currently. And this is going to cause problems going forward because these are leading sources of foreign exchange for the region. So it's going to cause problems in terms of balance of payments, in terms of paying for necessary imports going forward. I think there's a belief across the board that there's a need for a concerted uh, fiscal response. The problem for uh, some countries in our region is, of course, uh, debt to GDP levels are already quite high. So that in the Kenyan case, for example, we're talking about a debt to GDP ratio of around 60% of GDP. And that leaves le relatively less uh, fiscal space there for governments to, to give a fiscal push to the economy. So we saw welcome measures, for example, the central banks of Kenya and Rwanda have both undertaken measures to improve liquidity and uh, and uh, give more leeway to, to, to people that have to pay back loans, for example. But I think really, crucially, we need to step up the fiscal response. And there have been calls at the continental level for an increase in support from the donor community. And there's been one call, for example, of a of a hundred billion dollar uh, emergency support to African countries to help them weather the storm. And I think that's going to be necessary at the macro scale. At the micro scale, of course, it's very much a question of uh, people's livelihoods and looking for measures to actually support the people that are temporarily out of employment because of the freeze, you know, the lockdown that we're seeing in a number of countries. Um, so uh, that's going to be a very important issue. Social protection measures are going to need to be scaled up very rapidly, I think, to support those people. Some people who have also been a bit worried uh, when it comes to uh, trusting their governments, um, uh, when it comes to this amount of financial support that is being pumped into uh, some of the African economies to go towards uh, supporting and mitigating the uh, impact of the coronavirus crisis. What sort of measures are being put in place by organizations like yours to ensure accountability of uh, the usage of such kind of financing? Um, I don't think things have got to that stage where we're talking about accountability of sources, uh, sources of finance. At the moment, we're, we're just looking for the additional finance. So, I mean, as I said, this uh, request has been made, for example, to the donor community to step up their support. Um, I think governments are going to have to be creative across the region in terms of the kind of support. Um, we're going to see debt to GDP levels going up across the board globally. And actually, the industrialized high income countries have much higher debt to D GDP ratios than most African countries now. Um, so actually, if you look at the debt-to-GDP ratio of countries across the region, it's pretty favorable compared to high-income countries. The difficulty for African countries is, of course, the interest payments that they're paying on a lot of the debt are, is considerably higher than uh, high-income countries are paying on their own debt. Um, there's going to be a lot of macroeconomic changes in the world, which is going to change the, the whole scenario, I think, for, for management of finance uh, for the African continent and globally. Um, if I, if I may add to that, um, yes, I mean, I think going forward as well, uh, we're also going to see a problem in terms of imports across the region because of the foreign exchange uh, shortages that I alluded to earlier. Now, the positive side of that is I think uh, our organization, the Economic Commission for Africa, has been very much in favor of um, implementing the African continental free trade area. And we're going to see a lot of disruption, and we're already seeing it actually on, on some scale of a disruption of existing supply chains and a lot of imports coming from outside. I think it's going to make countries redouble efforts on regional integration going forward over the mid to long term, and that will be a very welcome reaction to this crisis. I want to leave you, uh, Andrew, but uh, before you go, so that we can allow for Octopizo and Alexander to join in the conversation, one last question I'll ask you, Andrew, is from a positive side, what are we seeing? What, of course, what, yeah. what, what, what message of hope do you think can come out of the organization? Um, I know we've spoken about the expected impact on the African economies. I know we've talked about um, you know, the slow growth of economies during this particular crisis, but what do you think is the positive light at the end of the tunnel today for the African continent? 
Well, as I, as I mentioned in my last response, Eugene, I, th I think it's very important that African countries, you know, push this agenda of uh, greater self-reliance and particularly um, pushing the African Continental Free Trade Agreement forward. Um, I can't underestimate the disruption going forward I see to these global supply chains, and this counts for the, the Western countries and Asian countries as well as for Africa. Um, but that presents an opportunity. So, for example, currently uh, Eastern Africa depends around one-fifth of all its imports come from China, another tenth comes from India, and another 20% from the European Union. I think it's time for countries really to act in a positive frame to see how they can uh, supply more goods uh, locally and regionally. And the African Continental Free Trade Agreement is the framework to do that. So going forward, I think Africa could over the mid to long term comes out come out stronger. The problem is going to be over this short term of dealing with the, the crisis measures and the support that's going to be required to the social sectors and the unemployed because of the crisis, dealing with the foreign exchange shortages and also of course uh, bolstering the healthcare system because that will be necessary going forward. Thank you so much for making time uh, to be with us. I will release you right now uh, so that we can be able to create some room for uh, the other panelists to join into this particular uh, conversation. But many, many thanks for making time to speak to us tonight. Thank course, you very much. Now, um, um, Wamoyo, I think uh, we'll be able to take a short break. Uh, Innocent as well. Uh, stay with us. We'll be able to come back to you shortly. Now, stay with us because we're going to take a very, very short break to allow for us to bring in um, uh, our other panelists, and that is Octopizo and Alexander of uh, the Refugees International, because we'll also be looking at what sort of uh, measures have been put in place for special people, special needs, and of course those who are, um, you know, uh, seeking refuge uh, across the world, especially during this particular time of the coronavirus. Stay with us. We'll be back in just a bit. mbali mbali nchini tunatamba na pia ni kuone ukiogelea kidogo tu uogelea tunasaka tunazungumza i have ridden to school using my father's bicycle ili mradi kukufahamisha wewe katika kipindi mfahamu kiongozi nina balance uzuri ni kwamba mke wangu pia anafanya kazi Usinipite mwokozi unisikie Katika ari na ukakamavu tunawapata Tunaangazia viongozi waliokuwepo na waliopo kutoka kaunti zote 47 pasi kubagoa wala kuchagua Ungana nami Elizabeth Mtuku kila siku ya Jumatano saa mbili kamili katika kipindi Mfahamu Kiongozi. Siasa ni sawa na usiku wa giza. Usiku uloja siri kila na karata. Na nitajaribu. Na inahitaji ujasiri kupenya. Tunapiga mdomo sana. Lakini hakuna kitu kigeni. Mimi wewe niambia nikataa kwenda kukamua ng'ombe maziwa yangu. Nimeleta mwenye katika bomba. Naomba kidogo. Wanaona kuja kwa baba na wanajiweka. Wacha nicheke kwa sababu eh nafikiri kwa sababu ya hizo nguo wanavaa wanaona wa Kenya wengine ni wajinga. You cannot have your cake and eat it. Na wakati wa Ruto kuumia kutokana na mao ni sasa. Baraza la siasa limejituma kutia mwangaza kwenye giza hili. Ungana nami Salome Mwiruri kila Alhamisi saa 2 jioni. Jamii imezungukwa na mambo mengi sana. 
Karibu tena mtazamaji unaendelea kutazama kipindi cha jamii na itikadi kutoka kwenye ndoa za mapema kuolewa is an option mila na desturi kuna nguo ya hapa stingirumu na kuna nguo ya chumbani dini wengi walipitia kwa many boyfriends mm -hmm. many girlfriends eh eh na hiyo ni uka hapa maisha ndani ya ndoa haoni vile atetema yeye ndio yapika ushabomba kuwa hapa tusemezana ukweli mazingira kama mimi niko na watoto na sisi kizani na ndugu yangu mm -hmm. watoto wangu wakiwa kwa umri mchanga sana mm -hmm ninaweza kuwa protect kidogo. Watu wangapi wanafanya kazi pamoja wakikutana ni maadui hawazungunzi. Siku mbili tatu haya huyu ana mimba, kwa nilipata na malaika. Bila kusahau tamaduni. Sauti za kinyanya za masogora kufundwa ni sauti 21. Ungana nami Fiona Kenga kila siku ya Ijumaa saa 12 jioni hadi saa moja ndani ya kipindi unachokienzi jamii na itikadi. Nikupe uhondo. So Peterson tumefutwa wote eh hey, yawa pia wewe eh tumeachiliwa si pia wewe unaweza anzisa biashara yako na hii economy venye iko tough sana but not too tough for mwananchi credit tutafanyaje si niko na five good cars we can get a quick logbook loan approved within six hours nataka kuanzisha salon na spa hii haitatosa si tuko na title deed pay we can still get more money using them Get a quick approval within 6 hours using your logbook or title deed. Do not get stuck. Call me on credit today. Simi likwambia. You are a big smart joke joke. Mwana inchi credit. Investor in people. With every new week comes new adventures, fresh expectations and new stories to tell. <laughs> Where others tell you stories as a youth, we will invite you to the table to critically debate. We will continuously recycle the same kind of leaders and the same kind of bad leaders that we end up complaining about later if we do not adopt a value and issue-based political system in this country. Well, of course, here on New Week, we are all about matters. Youth as youth. Analyze developing stories and how they are likely to shape up in the New Week. I think youths in Kenya need to find themselves what they are good at. Where are we in that trajectory as the youth right now? Are we starting where we are? It's more than just a current affairs program. electioneering period comes with promises. Promises that sometimes are just meant to get you buy-in. In this year's program, we said we are going to double the subsidy. We're going to make fertilizer even cheaper from 1,800. We're now going to check it down to 1,200. On Pledge Watch, what happens after Mahesh Miwa gets that seat is our core business. We will ask those tough questions. And where the promises have been delivered, we'll be here to celebrate the achievements. Pledge Watch, where a promise is indeed a debt. Join me, Linda Alela, every Tuesday at 9 p.m. as we get to ask these candid questions only on TV 47. Nijukua linaloapa vijana nafasi ya kuchangia kwa mada inayowaathiri. Vijana tukishikana we can bring a revolution. Tunaweza serikali sasa lakini serikali nyewe haizi kubali. Tunazungumza kuhusu ajira, afya, uongozi, ukuzaji wa talanta pamoja na masuala ibuka katika jamii. Ni mazungumzo bora inayofungua mlango wa suluhisho kwa masuala tata miongoni mwa vijana. Ungana nami Paul Kirobi kila siku ya Jumatano kuanzia saa 12 hadi saa moja jioni katika kipindi cha vijana mashinani wakati wetu ni sasa Coronavirus COVID-19 is a respiratory virus spreading across the world 
contact. The infection is spread from droplets of coughing and sneezing of an infected person, touching or shaking hands or being in contact with contaminated surfaces or objects with the virus. The signs and symptoms are fever, coughing, headache, body ache, difficulty in breathing. The disease can be prevented by regularly washing hands with soap and running water. Avoid close contact with people who have flu-like symptoms. Avoid handshake, hugs and kissing. Also, protect yourself by covering your mouth or nose using a disposable tissue while coughing or sneezing. If you experience these symptoms and you had traveled or been in contact with a person from a country reporting COVID-19, you should isolate yourself for 14 days and seek immediate medical attention or report to the nearest health center. This message has been brought to you by the government of Kenya and its partners. For accurate information on COVID-19, dial star 719 hash or call 719. Follow us on Twitter at MOH underscore Kenya at spokesperson GOK at WHO. Stimuli can be picked from the senses. So you can see here we have the incoming information that is coming in, uh, in form of the stimuli. In the first world war, the second world war, of course, is quite much of a spending. And that in Port Wars, of course, USA almost emerged as a victor because its economy was quite strong. The process or the how of uh, gaining evidence so that you can plunge or you can fill in the gap that you have already identified um, within our first phase of the process. So we have a variety of categories that we can talk of as vulnerable, where we have the infants and the young children, we have the pregnant and the lactating women, we have the elderly. Avoid you see threatening questions. If you don't tell me today, you know, now are you helping? That's not us. That's not, not a counseling session. So we say you also avoid what you call a threatening. Uh, they should always be avoided at any given time in any, uh, in any, counseling, in any counseling session. Uandishi wa habari uliokwenda darasani na kufuzu viema umetua rasmi. Lengo la keku ni kufahamisha jamii kwa taarifa ya kina kupitia upeo wa TV47. Unaotua kwa safari yenye hatua mpya na muonekano wa hali ya juu. Kila jumatatu saa moja jioni, Clifford Ndubi na Andrin Kilemi wanaibuka kwa taarifa stari. Andrin Kilemi atarejea tena jumanine saa moja jioni kwa ukurasa mwingine wa habari. Siku ya Jumatano Salome Mwiruri ndiye atakaye pasua mbarika ya habari na miale ya jua itakapotua magharibi siku ya Alhamisi Emmanuel Terer na Liz Mutuku watatua au sukani wa upeo Mnamo Ijumaa Paul Kirobi na Fiona Kenga watadadavua habari kwa njia ya aina yake Jumamosi haujasazwa na hodha wako Corazon Safin atahakikisha meli haikwendi mvange Josh Onsari ndiye atakayevalia njuga taarifa siku ya Jumapili ni ya kubwa ikiwa kufunga wiki kwa mpigo. TV 47 nyumbani mwa taarifa na adra sizo pakuliwa kwingi. Hey, so Peterson, tumefutwa wote. Eh hey, yawa, pia wewe. Hey tumeachiliwa si pia wewe unaweza anzisa biashara yako na hii economy venye iko tough sana but not too tough for mwananchi credit tutafanyaje si niko na five good cars we can get a quick logbook loan approved within six hours nataka kuanzisa salon na spa hii haitatosa si tuko na title deeds pay we can still get more money using them get a quick approval within six hours using your logbook or title deed do not get stuck call mwananchi credit today <laughs> si nilikwambia you are a big smart joke joke mwana inchi credit investor in people kutoka maeneo mbalimbali nchini tunatamba na pia ni kuone ukiogelea kidogo tu kuogelea tunasaka tunazungumza i have ridden to school using my father's bicycle ili mradi kukufahamisha wewe katika kipindi mfahamu kiongozi 
Nina bana uzuri ni kwamba mke wangu pia anafanya kazi. Usinipite moko si unisikie. Katika ari na ukakamavu tunawapata. Tunaangazia viongozi waliokuwepo na waliopo kutoka kaunti zote 47 basi kubagoa wala kuchagua Ungana nami Elizabeth Mtuku kila siku ya Jumatano saa mbili kamili katika kipindi Mfahamu kiongozi period comes with promises promises that sometimes are just meant to get you by in in this year's program we said we are going to double the subsidy we're going to make fertilizer even cheaper from 1800 we're not going to check it down to 1200 on pledge watch what happens after mheshimiwa gets that seat is our core business we will ask those tough questions and where the promises have been delivered we'll be here to celebrate the achievements pledge watch where a promise is indeed a debt join me linda alela every tuesday at 9 p.m as we get to ask these candid questions only on tv 47 Jamii imezungukwa na mambo mengi sana. Karibu tena mtazamaji unaendelea kutazama kipindi cha jamii na itikadi kutoka kwenye ndoa za mapema. Kuolewa is an option. Mila na desturi. Kuna nguo ya hapa sitengirumu na kuna nguo ya chumbani. Dini. Wengi walipitia kwa many boyfriends, mm -hmm. many girlfriends. Ehe. Uh -huh. Na hiyo ni uka hapa maisha ndani ya ndoa aone vile atetema yeye ndio yuapika ushabomba kuwa hapa tusemeza no kweli mazingira kama mimi niko na watoto na sisi kizani na ndugu yangu mm -hmm. watoto wangu wakiwa kwa umri mchanga sana mm -hmm ninaweza kuwa protect kidogo. Watu wangapi wanafanya kazi pamoja wakikutana ni maadui hawazungunzi. Siku mbili tatu haya huyu ana mimba, kwaona alipata na malaika. Bila kusahau tamaduni. Sauti za kinyanya za masogora kufundwa ni sauti 21. Ungana nami Fiona Kenga kila siku ya Ijumaa saa 12 jioni hadi saa moja ndani ya kipindi unachokienzi jamii na itikadi. Nikupe uhondo. Coronavirus COVID-19 is a respiratory virus spreading across the world. The infection is spread from droplets of coughing and sneezing of an infected person, touching or shaking hands or being in contact with contaminated surfaces or objects with the virus. The signs and symptoms are fever, coughing, headache, body ache, difficulty in breathing. The disease can be prevented by regularly washing hands with soap and running water. Avoid close contact with people who have flu-like symptoms. Avoid handshake, hugs, and kissing. Also, protect yourself by covering your mouth or nose using a disposable tissue while coughing or sneezing. If you experience these symptoms and you had traveled or been in contact with a person from a country reporting COVID-19, you should isolate yourself for 14 days and seek immediate medical attention or report to the nearest health center this message has been brought to you by the government of kenya and its partners for accurate information on covid 19 dial star 719 hash or call 719 follow us on twitter at moh underscore kenya at spokesperson gok at who stimuli can be picked from the senses so you can see here we have the incoming information that is coming in uh, in form of the stimuli in the first world war the second world war of course is quite much of a spent and that in port was of course USA almost emerged as a victor because its economy was quite strong the process or the how of uh, gaining evidence 
so that you can plunge or you can fill in the gap that you have already identified um, within our first phase of the process. So we have a variety of categories that we can talk of as vulnerable, where we have the infants and the young children, we have the pregnant and the lactating women, we have the elderly. Avoid using threatening questions. If you don't tell me today, you know, now are you helping? That's not nice. That's no, not a counseling session. So we say you also avoid what you call a threatening. Uh, they should always be avoided at any given time in any, uh, in any, counseling, in any counseling session. Thank you so much for still being with us uh, right here on uh, Youth Connect. My name as always is Eugene Adangwe. Tonight we're talking about how do we roll back the anticipated impact of the COVID-19 pandemic across the region, especially looking at the people uh, who are considered vulnerable in our communities. We are happy to say that we are now joined uh, by none other than Alexandra Lamash, who's actually Senior Advocate for West and Central Africa, and she is with Refugee international also joining us now is Octo Pizzo who's an artist and philanthropist both of them are joining us by way of audio uh, but of course uh, you can see the visuals of um, Kagure Wamoyo Wamunyo rather who's actually chief strategy officer at Kobo 360 and Innocent Zeimana who's an evacuee from Italy let me start uh, first of all by bringing in Alexandra on this particular conversation Alexandra we know that uh, uh, those who are refugees are among the people who probably or you know we need to actually consider them as far as this pandemic is concerned talk to me from where you sit do you feel that amongst all the advisories all the communications being made do you feel this group of people have been left out of um, the plans to keep them safe I do feel like they're not being considered. I mean, the majority of the education given by health officials indicate that people should be practicing social distancing and washing their hands, but in chronically densely populated uh, displacement camps, whether it be for internally displaced populations or refugee populations, access to water or clean water is extremely restricted. Uh, problem sanitation is, is often a problem. Access to health care is extremely limited. And on top of it, these are densely populated. The, the practices of social distancing cannot be done when there are multiple families in one shelter. So it, it's something that, that doesn't seem to apply to these populations and, and they're extremely vulnerable. Recommendation. Yeah, thank you, Eugene. Uh, my recommendation is that while, while countries grapple with this on their own, you know, in their own countries, they have to consider the fact that a lot of, of places sort of Further from further from their own homes um, are going to impact are going to be impacted in a very different way. Um, while while countries sort of increase uh, e economic stimulus packages and offer incentives to to support their own populations, we need to consider populations um, that are displaced. And while the majority of humanitarian responses worldwide are already and always underfunded, this this is the time to act. And we're seeing certain countries mobilize and provide funding for, for displaced populations or supporting the World Health Organization um, or the UN sort of announced an appeal which a lot of countries are contributing to. And, and now's the time to do that. A lot of these countries uh, might not have the, the resources to do it themselves, might not have the infrastructure to do it themselves. Or if we're looking at countries like Burkina Faso, where, where there are cases of coronaviruses within the government are increasing at a pretty rapid rate, including the death of um, the second vice president of the National Assembly, this is going to limit the government's capacity to be dealing with this as, as members of the government are having to deal with their own health. Um, so we're going to see a lot of limitations in service provision, whether it be from the government or from humanitarian actors.
So you say that it is difficult to actually practice some of the advisories that are being given out, for example, social distancing in the refugee camps. Um, so what, what sort of scenario are we staring at right now, Alexandra? I mean, when you establish a displacement camp, it's always very, very difficult to begin with to allocate enough land for for these populations. And what we're one way around it would be to to increase the size of displacement camps, make deals with the government to allocate new plots of land for new displacement camps. The issue is when you spread populations further apart, social distancing also makes them perhaps feel more vulnerable to violence, which is a very, very tricky thing when people feel safer when there's a bigger number of populations. Also, if you were to take a displacement camp and spread it apart, it means that you need to have more health facilities or more access to latrines on that camp, right? Because it, it goes by it by by the size. You need to have better lighting so that it's safe for these populations. And doing that on a bigger surface or a bigger piece of land is tricky for humanitarian actors. So if we want humanitarian actors or governments to do a better job to deal with this crisis within displaced populations, international governments are going to have to provide more funding to be able to do that. We, we have a situation where now we have, uh, of course, we understand people who are seeking refuge are probably running away from um, a, a scenario that uh, probably could cause them harm. But now we are seeing countries grounding their planes. Of course, we have seen borders closed down because of, uh, you know, protecting other civilians from uh, moving the coronavirus. Um, how do people seeking asylum, uh, you know, behave in this particular period now? I mean, that's hard to predict as the situation evolves. UNHCR did announce that it was going to be halting its um, refugee resettlement program. So that means that these populations who felt that they were about to be resettled are now going to have to wait. Um, that's going to be extremely frustrating for a lot of people. It's going to become frustrating as humanitarian assistance is probably going to be limited by a lot of these flights being grounded or the lack of rotation of new, new staff. So a lot of people's needs are going to go unmet. So this is going to be frustrating. A lot of people are going to feel very stir crazy in these times. It also means that whenever the resettlement programs are reinitiated, there's going to be a massive backlog. So if, if UNHCR has to pause all of its resettlement for six months or even a year, depending on how this plays out, this is going to have pretty dire consequences on, on the ability for countries to absorb these populations all at once when that, that, you know, that pause is lifted. Right, that's the voice um, of uh, Senior Advocate for West and Central Africa at the Refugees International, Alexander Lamash. Thank you so much for uh, making time for joining us. Let me bring in uh, Octopizo. Octopizo, we've had a lot of uh, people speaking about what we expect as far as the impact of coronavirus is concerned. You know, I don't know how people at home are receiving this, whether they're becoming more scared or more worried, but uh, speak to me and speak to the rest of the nation when it comes to giving a sense of hope uh, to the vulnerable communities, what, what should we be doing to support them, to help them reduce the impact of coronavirus from where they are? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I hear you, Octopizo. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, I can hear you now. Oh, okay, so from, from, my, from my end, um, I'd say it's not a matter of hope right now. It's a matter of like doing what is right and what should be done. Like there's like a sequence or like things to follow. We can't be believing in hope and waiting for hope every time. This hope thing doesn't work for people who come from where we come from. We come from like the lady who said work with the refugees. We come from a place where we build on community. Everything is community generated business. We depend on each other. So if you telling people like, for example, to sit home for 14 days, there's no hope. They, they, they'll, they'll get hungry after some time and then that will give birth to another thing like crime. And people will start looking for houses where there is food and then they start robbing people and like that. So I don't think it's a matter of hope at this point. It's a matter of like actually the whole nation and not only the government, because we know the government is already failing with it, but the whole nation, like private sector and individuals to come in and be their neighbor's keeper, like the way it has been before. Like 
if actually people have to to stay home for like two weeks, there has to be like so there's like a way of making these people stay home for two weeks. Like you have to feed them if their people work from hand to mouth. Like whatever is happening in Rwanda, the president say every household will be supplied with food for the next two weeks as long as the uh, the curfew or the quarantine is is going on. But you can't tell people who you work from hand to mouth to go and stay in the house for two. It's not practical. How are they going to feed their kids? And it's not a matter of hope. It's a matter of practicality. What is doable and what is not? I'm sure if today you go to Mukuru or Korosho and Kibera and tell people stay in the house, we'll provide for you food for the next few days that you'll be staying in the house until this thing is sorted out. Everybody will be in the house. Nobody will be fighting with police. So it's not rocket science. It's logic. And, and that's and what, our, yes. what the leaders should be doing right now. Yes, this is what the leader should be doing right now. Octopizo, of course, the people who have been saying that, uh, you know, these whole measures that are being uh, announced to help us, uh, you know, avoid coronavirus, for example, uh, you know, sanitizing, washing hands, uh, you know, social distance, mm -hmm. is, is indeed something that is impractical for people who are uh, living in, let's say, informal settlements, uh, who probably do not have the luxury of seeing running water. Uh, so what would be the practical solutions from where you sit for now like what we've been doing with the uh, like let's say the shofko and there's another organization called uh Kiber that is installing uh hand wash centers mm -hmm. at least that's where we can start now like at least people we put them in public places we have stations in toy market all crowded places at least people have clean uh hands at least they have somewhere that they can go and clean their hands uh that's the first thing i think we have to say but when you say like people have to have space that will never work mm. in kibera or in informal settlements where every house is like one room and that one room is bedroom sitting room kitchen and you live there with like three kids mm. or two mm. even two people is way crowded for that house so there will be no way you can quarantine in that situation but things like washing hands, we can make water free and available. Like the Nairobi City Council can make water. We have water that can serve people for free. Mm. We have it in Kibera. So that means they are able to make it anywhere for people to wash their hands, uh, maybe in public places. That's, I would say, the first place. The second is messaging. I think the information that is being sent out, they've never, they, they haven't been like an exact message trickle down to the slums. Mm. Every message when we see like the Minister of Health, everything he speaks, he speaks in English. Not everybody speaks English. Mm. Mm. Yeah, so some people, like places like Siaya and those sites, people don't even know what's going on. They think this disease is for people in the urban areas. Mm. The, the thing is like, oh, this is something for urban areas. People not even talk about rural areas where probably we have the most elderly people mm. and if this thing gets to rural areas we'll have way more catastrophic things mm. than whatever is happening already in urban right so the information is not there we haven't gotten the right information like this is what you should everything is just there's like 10 things going on like wash your hands stay in indoors wash your hands but there's no explained ways of doing this this place where go they tell us Wash your hands after every 20 minutes. Who washes their hands after every 20 minutes? Mm. It's not practical. Mm. So there's no exact like one information that is trickling down throughout the country. Mm. There's like 10 to 100 different things being said. And this is also making people be in a, a panic and paranoid state. Mm. And you, making things worse. Right. B before I bring in... Um, um, uh, Kagure uh, on this uh, October while you're still with us. Um, tell me, yeah. do you think that probably this is a scenario that probably has caught many off guard, especially the government, and so it is a bit difficult to actually know even how to deal with it all the same? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. This is why we have, mi ev we have ministries for everything. If today there was a war between us and Uganda, the army should show up. Mm -hmm. Now we have a war with disease. The health should show up. Mm -hmm. This is the time to show up. Mm -hmm. All these years, what have they ever showed up to? Mm -hmm. People, we have doctors that study for over six years for days like this. Mm 
Mm-hmm. This is the time that they should show up. It's not like, oh, this God is really off guard. Yes, everything is always off guard, but there's a budget for health. Mm-hmm. These insurance companies, where are they now? Because they take the normal Monainchi to like, let's say, Bagathi, but then there's people being taken to, I don't know, Dagoretti, there's other people in Aga Khan. There's now, there's like all these different stages of people, of how they're being treated in the same, and the disease is one. Mm. So I don't think like it was a surprise. I think it's just like we, would, we didn't take it as serious as they should have taken it. They just thought like, oh, this is another thing. It will come and go like after two weeks, after a month. Because we started hearing about Corona not two weeks ago. Mm-hmm. People are even making fun of the uh, Chinese people in Kenya. Like, oh, Corona, Corona, and then now it is here. Mm-hmm. All this time the government has been seeing this. Yeah. We could have been prepared, you know. We could have been prepared. We started other places. We could have been prepared. We saw over three countries, people dying before it got here. And we were just chilling. Right. People yeah. were just chilling. People, people were just coming in and out. Yeah. So, no, I think this is the time that they should show us what actually they're doing. Right. They must show what up. they've been prepared to do. They must show yeah. up. Yes. Kagure, I mean... W- you know, right now, for some people, they're saying that uh, we are past that stage of uh, saying what is it that we could have done to avoid it. Now it is here with us. Um, from where you sit, uh, what is it that we should do now, uh, even if we miss that stage of having prepared ourselves to deal with this particular coronavirus? What is it that we should be doing right now uh, to ensure that we mitigate, at least reduce uh, the impact that we are staring at right now? So one of the first things we need to ask ourselves um, is what are the uh, possible scenarios that could happen? Mm -hmm. Now, in the event that we have to continue, say, or enter a lockdown, the question becomes, how do we get food to get to the people? How do we get food to actually get to, you know, to the manufacturers so that the unga can now be distributed to people? And the first thing is, you know, Identifying beyond just the health sector, Mm. there's the manufacturing sector, there's the logistics sector. Mm. We want to work with government and be like, what's the plan? You know, it would be great if there were committees that were looking into the different areas that are going to be impacted. If we need to distribute food door to door, Mm. there are companies that do this. How can we tap into private sector to support government to Mm. actually identify how food can be distributed Mm. door to door? Mm. Or the second thing is before we wait for a maize shortage, or a wheat shortage, or a cooking oil shortage because, you know, um, the raw products are not being imported or food is not moving. What are these plans that have been put in place or how can we work with government before it gets to this situation to ensure that at least we mitigate the impact and try to continue providing for essential goods? So I think the key thing is that looking beyond just the health sector, Let us identify what are the other areas that are likely to be uh, disrupted. What are the core and essential, you know, services that citizens of the various countries in Africa need in order for us to continue surviving? And then the third thing is, how can we plan for the scenario? You know, waking up to a situation where, say, there's curfew or there's lockdown, will drivers be able to move food? How would this happen? You know, plans for ensuring that nations continue, that people survive, that people have their basic needs, need to happen right now. And I think we in private sector, we in tech industry are saying we're ready and willing to help because we understand it's a pandemic. We understand the issue of being overwhelmed. And we're saying we're ready to step up. We're ready to provide these services. Uh, We're ready to work with government. So planning ahead. Yeah, but but, but, uh, Wamunyu, what are we waiting for then as private sector for the government to say okay guys now come help us are we waiting for a bell to be rung for us to jump in or are we also repeating the same mistake that dr piso said we had the signs we saw it coming but we did not act as soon as we were supposed to act what is the private sector waiting for to jump in and support in these areas 
So in the logistics, I'll speak to the logistics industry and what Kobo 360 is doing. We are continuing to serve. We are continuing to move food mm -hmm. uh, because we know that this is needed. So we, if, despite uh, the, uh, what is happening, we have said that we will continue working with transporters to provide services such that food is transported, whether it's from the firms, whether it's from um, the grain industries and being brought to to millers so that people can get unga or whatever. So what it is, is the first thing from private sector is for us, it's looking at is what is our area of expertise? Mm -hmm. Is it an essential service? We are saying yes. If it is an essential service, our first commitment is to ensure continuity. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is ensuring we have a plan in the event of a lockdown or in the event that there is a shortage of things. Do you but have a plan one, right now? Uh Kagure. We have a plan uh -huh. from a private sector perspective, uh -huh. What's the which plan? is saying Briefly. that mm -hmm. our plan is how we work with staff, mm -hmm. how we ensure some of our staff can be able to work even when there is, a, you know, a, a, when there is a challenge because of the pandemic. We're okay. saying we're able to provide them with what they need in order to move. We have communication, keeping drivers, keeping our partners up to date with what's happening. And then working with our stakeholders, asking them, what is your food supply chain looking like? How can we plan ahead and ensure we have trucks? We've communicated with drivers mm. that beforehand we will need this food moved from point X to point Y. So that's the plan we're having. But the second and important stage is having visibility of um, where we're going, saying that in the event that we need to distribute food door to door, we are saying that we are here we're ready to do it. So right now we're doing the back end supply chain yeah. of food to the manufacturers and we're, uh, to the manufacturers. Now we're saying that if there's food and it needs to get door to door, we're You'll ready be able to, to, help do it. to help. Right. Yes. Let me bring in Innocent. Innocent, you come from a country which many people are not really finding a way to understand how certain things are able to be executed. You had even Octopizo mention that in Rwanda, uh, the president has actually ordered that food is distributed to the vulnerable families door to door. I mean, share with us, I mean, what, what, what is making Rwanda so different? What makes it possible for such things to happen in Rwanda and a bit difficult in other African countries? Just from where you sit from experience from your country. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think the, uh, the, the something Rwanda is uh, doing different from other countries mm. is I think they've learned from the mistakes of others, if I can say, mm -hmm. because uh, I have been in Italy and uh, I think one of the cause of what, that tragedy that we are we are seeing is the delay of acting mm -hmm. they've delayed much to to act to put the, the to put the lockdown and other measures because the lockdown has come uh more than one month after the first case mm. and i was there since the first case arrived people are still thinking it's a just normal uh, it's, a, it's a normal influenza, it will pass very soon uh, until they were overwhelmed, mm. uh, as you can see. Mm. So I think uh, Rwanda has realized that once it comes at that stage, uh, maybe they will not manage mm. to be too late. Mm. And uh, that strategy is very good, and I will say it's the only one which will work to stop this uh, uh, this virus uh, because now there is no treatment there is no uh, vaccine. vaccine so the the only way is to stop it moving mm. and doing that is stopping people uh, moving so rwanda has done that and i think they understand that they maybe the costs um of uh caring sick people and the others will be uh much more than uh, uh the resources to for maybe a shorter uh, lockdown mm. so they they've done that they they're able to feed those who 
uh, uh, who are who are uh, living like on daily basis. They were yeah. eating because they've worked that day. Yeah. Uh, and they, they've brought in. Uh, I've seen. I've seen many. Uh, uh, organizations here, uh, private sector coming in and also helping the government and uh, uh, also donating food and other things. So I think uh, it's the perfect way and other uh, African countries need to learn from that. Otherwise, uh, we'll be uh, overwhelmed. We'll be overwhelmed. Octopizo, if you're still uh, there with us, I mean, what I wanted to ask you is listening to what Innocent is saying uh, from Rwanda, um, where do you think mm -hmm. the mistake is? Do you think um, the Kenyans over rely on their government um, to an extent that, you know, when we, we are caught in a scenario where the government can't do much, we all sync with it. Or do you feel that we as Kenyans are rightful in demanding for more from our government to the point that when they fail us, we need to actually put them on the spot? I think it's both, mm -hmm. I would say. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, think, uh, I think as Kenyans, as normal Kawaida Kenyans, you know, we've, we've also failed our people because the government can't go door to door making sure like uh, that we are in the house mm -hmm. or that we are, we are quarantining but you as as, a, as an individual if you know someone if like you're my neighbor and you know i've been traveling and i just go back and i think in every neighborhood they'll say even in kibera there's like small like plots you know who lives here and who lives there mm -hmm. you could just say like oh you know you've been traveling can you just stay home or is there any way you could get somewhere to stay for 14 days before you do this and this. The government can't be going every house telling us what's happening, you know, they can't be in everywhere. Yeah. But again, it's their jurisdiction to do that. Mm. It's their job to make sure, like, to call on, like, this coffee thing, like this coffee thing, I don't understand it until now. I mm. still don't understand it, why we have a curfew from 7 p.m. So what, like, the coronavirus only is is working at night and during the day it's not working mm. you know like i don't i don't understand the logic if mm. it's if it's about people going to party in clubs they could ban alcohol i saw there's a country that just banned alcohol mm. for the until all this is sorted out but the most important thing is that they should have gotten people earlier way earlier yeah. to be at home they should have spread this message before we had the first case they should have cancelled Kenya Airways, all those. We can't do those as individuals, but yeah. the government can do that. So we failed to a certain level on our part, and we are realizing late, mm. and they failed in the bigger part of their part, because then if they could have locked all the flights from coming in and going now, there's high chances we won't be here. Mm. We, will, we have, won't be having 7,000 people quarantined in a high school, you know, which yeah. they haven't even told us. Like, we just finding that out as people from the streets. Yeah. They should be honest with us with the situation. Like, this situation is actually serious. People are dying. They should be way more serious about things. And they can do it. I feel like it's not that they can't do it. Mm. They can do it. And they don't have to do it in a police brutality way where they kick people and beat men and women in the streets. You yeah, know? yeah, it's been in our and spirit. As this Kenyans. has been there before. Yes, yes, indeed. It's been in our spirit as Kenyans to actually come together. We, 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 we've known each other from that particular spirit of Harambe, Umoja, and all that. Um, Okto, yeah. earlier on, um, uh, Kagure said that they are ready as private sector to jump in and support government. When they say we want to do door-to-door -door delivery of mm -hmm. foods, they are ready to do it. Do, do you think that mm -hmm. we need a group of Kenyans to just come out voluntarily and not wait to be told to do it, would you think this is what we need to do now? Exactly. This is what, this is what we are doing now. Uh -huh. We have, there's, a, there's this uh, lady that we even partnered with that has been giving food in Kibera, like yesterday gave like a hundred doors, and these are guys that just fundraised from Twitter. They didn't, they didn't wait. Uh -huh. You know, they didn't, we, didn't, we didn't have to wait for the government to tell us what to do. She's called Asha. Yeah. You know, Asha Jaffa. Mm -hmm. She's been just fundraising and 
taking food everywhere to especially the needy families. Mm. Uh, my friend from Shofko, Mr. Ken, when I told like we need to make stations for water so that people can wash their hands and we get the soaps and everything, because all those, those soaps are money, everything is money. They didn't wait for the government, we just went and bought the soap, installed, got some of our friends, make sure toy, we have these two stops. Next, where are we going? Mukuru, where are we going? Kangware, mm. like that. We don't have to wait for these guys. We just need to see if you have people that are thinking the same, you just collaborate and make this thing happen. We are ready from our end. We will go anywhere. We will go even to the refugee camps. Mm -hmm. I've worked there. I've worked in Kakuma and Dada for four years. Mm. And I'm sure the situation that is in Kibera is the same situation that is there. You know, so yeah. we will go everywhere. If the people are ready, we should do it now and save our people. But if we're waiting for a number of people from the parliament to actually do this, people who live, who probably have never slept hungry or have high chances if that even if they're sick, they have insurance to go to the hospital and all that. What people don't understand when you come from places like camps and informal settlements people have been fighting pneumonia every single day cholera typhoid everything this is not their panic yeah. their panic is how they're gonna eat their panic is not getting the virus at this point mm. but the worst thing is that when they get the virus so whether you are hiding in runda there's high chances you'll get the virus too mm. 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 so this is not a disease where like you could say oh this is kibera people disease no if we get it you could get it in Europe. The Prime Minister of UK has it. Mm. You are not bigger than the Prime Minister of UK. Yeah. So it's not you can't say like, oh, this is not our business. Let the Kibera people do their thing. No, we we when we are walking in town, it's not written on my head like this guy's from Kibera. You will not know where I'm from. Yeah. And I might be carrying this virus. So it's our time as Kenyans, leave alone the government, to react. Because we've seen them fail and not once, not twice. They had money for BBI campaigns every single day. Now there's no money for feeding the streets. It doesn't make sense. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. How do we then spread, like the way coronavirus is spreading, how do we spread this goodwill of people like Asha and you and the rest? How do we spread mm -hmm. this, uh, uh, just the way the virus is spreading across the world? How do we spread this goodwill? amongst all of us as Kenyans, to be able to kick in and support and, and, and do something now? I think we just start as small as we, we can from our neighborhood and then it becomes chain reaction. Like, uh, I like how Kenyans can come together, but sometimes it also no. makes me feel weird that we only come together when people are dying. We don't come together to stop the deaths. Like, people are so worried about economy. Like, we can actually come back from economy, but we cannot bring back dead people. True. Perfect. I don't care even if the economy goes to zero. You know, if the economy goes to zero, we could still come back to 100. But once somebody is dead, there's no coming back. So we should think of more prevention measures than always coming when, people, when it's worse, when, like, people are dying. We are not even there yet. We are not in the worst place yet, I think. And we can still stop this. We can still make things better. And this start from it starts from your neighborhood. It starts from your neighbor. It starts from you. And we can share our contacts and start doing this everywhere and talk to our people. Our people understand us more than they will understand maybe a member of parliament because this guy only comes when there is campaign. Mm. But he sees you every day. Mm. He probably respects you more than he respects the member of parliament. And so we should come into, we should take leadership roles as individuals at this point and not always say like, oh, I'm waiting for the member of parliament, senator or governor to do this. They will not do it. And even if they do it, they can't do it for everyone. Only Kibera, there's over 900,000 people. Like, how are you going, how is one MP or the president going to hit these people? But what if there's a chain reaction of neighbors talking and the, the mamas of Chamas, the chairman, the kijis, the chiefs, everything? It will go away smoothly, no violence, just neighbors helping each other. It has been done before, so we can do it. So we can do it. 
Thank you. I think what I, I hear from you is that it is not yet too late. We can do something. And if we start now, we'll be able mm -hmm. to catch up and, and be able to do it. I want us to take a very short break. But of course, uh, there is actually uh, live pictures uh, on your screen uh, right now. This is the CBD and what is going on right now in the effort of reducing the impact of the COVID-19 um, here in Kenya. There is actually fumigation going on. Uh, as you can see, those are live pictures uh, right about now. Uh, uh, that is uh, Nairobi CBD of course uh, our teams are on the ground just trying to find a f or have a feel of uh, what's going on out there have people really respected this curfew I see there's a vehicle right there I'm hoping that's one of the people who are listed under the uh, essential uh, you know, services. Uh, but uh, we can see this going on in the streets. But the key question right now is um, uh, whether this is going to actually help in reducing the spread of this particular virus. Uh, that we do not know for sure. But there is hope that definitely some of the contaminated areas will be fumigated. And, uh, of course, uh, we might be able to reduce uh, that particular issue. But since uh, Octopus spoke about Kibra and, and, and what is going to be done uh, or what should be done to ensure that information is passed across uh, uh, the, the people who are actually uh, who need this particular information. There's actually what we understand that public service announcements um, are actually broadcast almost on a daily basis on various platforms to actually prevent the spread of COVID-19. However, uh, we understand that there are people who lack access to conventional media and thus missing out on the important message that uh, is actually geared towards curbing the virus spread. Now, Sylvia Odiambo is actually a reporter right here on TV47, amongst our young reporters on Sautietu. She lives in Kibra, and she actually says that there are artists in Kibra who have found innovative ways to sensitize the community on how to stop the virus from spreading. Let's take a look at this particular piece, and then we'll come back to hear from our panelists on where do we go from here. Take a look. Mural projects are increasingly popular form of public art that transforms outdoor spaces into public art galleries. And Weza art members are doing something special to the people of Kibera. Art speaks a lot. It captures uh, one's mind and when your mind is captured then uh, you get the information and you practice the information. Their writings are inspired by the coronavirus which is causing devastating effects to many countries across the world. At first people thought that uh, this was a joke, this was a joke, until now maybe some don't have job, maybe some have, uh, nowadays they don't go to their jobs, so they have started to realize that uh, this coronavirus is very serious. People passing along the streets of Kibera post to admire their work. That way, they get the message about the virus. Thanks to the locals who have given the artists from Kibera freedom to express themselves. So when you read there, we find it that it's so good to us because we, we find knowledge there that can help some of us, our community. Demo tells me this is the only easy way he can help stop the spread of the virus. It is a right way and it is an easy way for me to communicate since, one, since I'm skilled in it and I'm talented in it. That is why I'm, I'm doing it. This is not the first time they are using art to pass important messages. They have in the past used murals to educate the locals the importance of keeping the environment clean, safety, and self-identity. A lot has been said, wash your hands, keep distance, and sanitize. With every stroke, these young men hope they are stopping the spread of the virus. For Youth Connect, I'm Sylvia Adiambo.
coronavirus, COVID-19, is a respiratory virus spreading across the world. The infection is spread from droplets of coughing and sneezing of an infected person, touching or shaking hands or being in contact with contaminated surfaces or objects with the virus. The signs and symptoms are fever, coughing, headache, body ache, difficulty in breathing. The disease can be prevented by regularly washing hands with soap and running water. Avoid close contact with people who have flu-like symptoms. Avoid handshake, hugs and kissing. Also, protect yourself by covering your mouth or nose using a disposable tissue while coughing or sneezing. If you experience these symptoms and you had traveled or been in contact with a person from a country reporting COVID-19, you should isolate yourself for 14 days and seek immediate medical attention or report to the nearest health center. This message has been brought to you by the government of Kenya and its partners. For accurate information on COVID-19, dial star 719 hash or call 719. Follow us on Twitter at MOH underscore Kenya at spokesperson GOK at WHO. Stimuli can be picked from the senses. So you can see here, we have the incoming information that is coming in, uh, in form of the stimuli. In the first world war, the second world war, of course, is quite much of a spending. And that import was, of course, USA almost emerged as a victor because its economy was quite strong. The process or the how of uh, gaining evidence so that you can plunge or you can fill in the gap that you have already identified um, within our first phase of the process. So we have a variety of categories that we can talk of as vulnerable, where we have the infants and the young children, we have the pregnant and the lactating women, we have the elderly. Avoid using threatening questions. If you don't tell me today, you know, now are you helping? That's not nice. That's no, not a counseling session. So we say you also avoid what you call a threatening. Uh, they should always be avoided at any given time in any, uh, in any, counseling, in any counseling session. pictures uh, at uh, the Nairobi Central Business District of course empty streets but all we can see right there is uh, some sort of fumigation going on and of course uh, those are live pictures that we bring to you live right here on Youth Connect now uh, back to a conversation just to be able to uh, wrap this conversation up we have Octo Pizzo on the line uh, and also we have Innocent Zaymana who's talking to us from uh, Rwanda He's an evacuee from Italy, and also we have Kagure Wamunyu, who's Chief Strategy Officer at Kobo 360. Um, of course, uh, ladies and gentlemen, right now everybody is sort of worried. Most people are um, scared crazy. You know, what do they do? We have those who are being told to work from home, but some of them, majority of them, have jobs that may not allow them to be able to work from home because uh, maybe we have taxi drivers who cannot work from home and all that. Um, uh, maybe, Faith, from where you sit, you said you are ready as an organization, as a private sector institution uh, to support where possible. But let's look at the reality on the ground uh, when we tell people to work from home. How do we ensure that some of these measures are actually taken uh, seriously after thinking or looking at what I just mentioned earlier on? 
So as you as you pointed out, it is it is true. Not everybody can work from home. Mm -hmm. So, for example, as in logistics, we will always need field officers who are there during loading, etc. I think it is the duty of private sector. If you have employees in the field working, provide them with what is necessary as Mm -hmm. an employer, Mm -hmm. whether it is the gloves, whether it's hand hand sanitizer or whatever else is recommended by WHO and the Ministry of Health. Mm -hmm. I think that's the first thing. Understanding that the reality is people need to go to work, but at the same time, you need that to be careful about the health and the um, and safety of your employees. Mm. So I think that's the first thing. The second is that every person or every company has different specialties in time of need. There are things that we are good at or we focus on. So how can we use this, not just for the development of the company, but also for the good of society or the markets that we are in? Mm. So being in multiple markets, having different initiatives to be able to cover this. I think this is um, what is needed at the moment in this time. Mm. And we are ready to do this. And we have already started doing this. Right. Innocent, you are in in, in quarantine right now and some people, uh, we've had even some sad news here in Kenya of uh, some people who have uh, become very depressed and others have even committed suicide when they heard of the issue of going into quarantine. Just just speak to us about um, the importance of understanding why it is necessary and and, and what measures are being done where you are that would encourage other people to voluntarily say that this is something I'd want to do. And if I don't have enough space here, I'm happy to go to where the government or private institutions working with the government have put up for people to go to those particular spaces. Yeah, thank you. I think uh, everyone now need to understand that uh, uh, it's now uh, urgent to take this uh, situation serious mm. from the government level to individual level. Mm. Of course, now the, the virus is within us, uh, but at least we can limit the damage. Mm. The, some are there and will be there, but we need at least to limit them. Mm. So if everyone can understand that, and at individual level, uh, uh, be prepared to do everything you can to limit the the spread. That that will be good. Mm. Uh, like I will say, uh, the way I was prepared to be in quarantine, uh, I think I can't be depressed because I understand very well the reason I'm in the quarantine. Mm. So we need to. Uh, to sensitize everyone, to make everyone aware of the situation and the reason things are happening the way uh, they are happening. Mm. And uh, that will, will uh, help people not to, to be in mafia, to be depressed and uh, to arrive at the level of uh, committing suicide. So here uh, uh, in Rwanda, uh, there are many uh ways of communicating uh, from radios tvs and social medias i think now everyone um, is aware and then there are uh, enforcement mm. bodies which are there to help mm. uh in a, in a good way not traumatizing uh anyone um and uh, uh and i will say from maybe those who have not yet done the total lockdown. Mm. Uh, when enforcing, people need to be uh, uh, to be uh, aware that if not done well, they can cause collateral damage. I mean, uh, like enforcement bodies can even stop uh, patients who are going for their cancer treatment, for example, mm. and. They, they may suffer uh, the uh, other things because they have been stopped. So they, even in, in doing enforcement of uh, uh, preventive measures, they, they need to take every case uh, uh, as its own and, uh, uh, and uh, manage it uh, accordingly. Right. So otherwise, the important thing I, I, I will say is that everyone needs to, to be aware that's the important thing and 
understand uh, why everything is happening. Right. Perfect. Uh, Okto, your uh, final word tonight, what you mentioned earlier on that the government has to show up. Um, apart from the government showing up, in which way would you love to see the media show up, the NGOs show up, the private sector show up, this common one inch show up? I think, uh, yeah, I think the, the media, at, especially at this point, should be playing such a big role on also, like, sharing the right information, bringing the, uh, like, maybe talking to the right doctors, trying to go also talk to people who have actually been affected, mm. who have actually positive. I don't know how you can get them, but I'm sure if they're quarantined somewhere, you can still get them. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one way of spreading, like, the 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 nini the, the the information mm. and to trickle down to the right people two i think as media too you should also be participating on like this some of these solutions that we are suggesting like if it's about if people are going to stay out and stay in their houses for 14 days what is the media house is gonna do because mm. you also broadcast to these people mm. People want to watch like, oh, TV 47 is our favorite channel because actually when things were bad, they actually came to support us. Sometimes it go past being the most amazing artist, mm. the most amazing TV anchor, the most amazing radio presenter. Because at the end of the day in this generation, we are the leaders of this generation. Mm. And we need to start playing those, lead, taking those leadership roles and not just following and reporting and theory and theory. Mm -hmm. We need actions. And it's now for everyone. In our small bits, mm -hmm. it will go a long way. If you see how ants can carry a bone and their ants, if they come together like a hundred ants, they carry a bone. What can we do if you actually come together, all of us? Right. Perfect. Wonders, yeah. Perfect. Um, what about you, uh, Kagure? What, what, what do we need to do? Uh, Okto mentioned the people who should show up. Um, what, what could be your final call uh, to humanity? Because we have people who are still worried. Uh, some people are uh, wondering whether this is actually indeed the end of times or not. I mean, what, what sort of message would you be passing out there um, as we wrap up this conversation tonight? Um, I think the first thing is definitely that whatever directives we're given um, right now, it is as individuals, as Octopizo has mentioned, we also have the duty to ensure that we protect ourselves and our communities uh, where we come from. So the first thing is for uh, taking action as is directed or as is guided. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing. And the second thing is that we each have something we can contribute. If you are lucky enough to be home and you have food, what is it that you can do to those, say, you employ or those who you know or you may not know mm -hmm. who don't have food because they're not working? So what is it that we can do? And the, the third thing is what can be a, a systemic um, approach mm. in such a way that we're thinking of a large scale mm. uh, way of helping people. So whatever it is your expertise, it's now not a matter of one or two or three people. Mm. It's a matter of how can we help the nation? How can we help the continent? And so coming up with solutions that are scaling. And I think this is where calling on, you know, Kenya is known as a tech hub mm. um, for Africa. There are tech solutions that can actually help this if it's distribution, if it's mapping of people, mm. if it's where are people moving to. So just rallying different sectors, um, we in tech and thinking about how it is that we can contribute to solving um, the problem that we have ahead of us. Right. And I want to say thank you because of time. Um, I want to wrap it up on this particular note. But uh, Nasema Asante Sana, thank you for uh, taking your time to be part of this conversation uh, virtually. And of course, uh, to Andrew Mold, who joined us earlier on uh, from the UN Economic Commission for Africa. Uh, of course, Kagure Wamunyu, Chief Strategy Officer, Kobo 360. Octopizo, an artist and philanthropist, thank you for joining us. Innocent Zaymana, we wish you all the very best. And of course, Alexandra from the Refugees International. And all that made this particular conversation a success, including Judith Wambua, who's on our timeline saying, uh, using uh, talent for a noble cause. Keep it up. This is 
authorities with regards to the story that we aired earlier on by our young journalist from Kibra. Thank you very much for making time uh, to be part of Youth Connect uh, tonight. We will see you again, uh, God willing, next time, same place, to our producers and all the teams, Asante Nisana, to our sign language interpreter as well. Thank you for uh, the energy and the effort uh, to pass this message to all the people uh, watching us tonight. Asante Nisana, and we'll uh, leave you with the videos of uh, what is actually happening in the streets of Nairobi right now. But later on, we would love to cool your nerves a bit and there's a very great movie coming up that I want to keep you engaged uh, on. Keep it TV 47. We'll see you next time. My name as always is Eugene Anangwe. Goodbye for now. COVID-19 is a respiratory virus spreading across the world. The infection is spread from droplets of coughing and sneezing of an infected person, touching or shaking hands or being in contact with